my younger brother uh, had spinal meningitis when he was one or two years old. And so he grew up with seizures um, until he passed away from a seizure when he was 25. So I kind of grew up in that space of just brain, being interested in brain health. Um, how can we help the neurological system? My mom has had Lyme disease since maybe the late 70s, at least the early 80s. You know, watching her go through that, it's, it's affected her body greatly. You know, it went decades without really good treatment. And so, and part of that, part of what's affected is her brain, more on a sleep level uh, scale. Right after I was actually done with residency, or my father actually got uh, diagnosed with ALS, another major neurological quandary. You know, he passed away, gosh, it's been seven years now. Think what we have now in our office and, and what is available elsewhere is more, more than it was five, seven, ten years ago. And so the uh, the healing realms, the healing industry in the United States is, is improving. Dr. Yoshi, welcome to the Keto Camp podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I was just telling you how much I admire the work that you're doing. I got familiar with your work with uh, Dr. Daniel Pampa, who is my mentor, and I work with him, and he speaks so highly of you. So I'm so grateful he connected us. We're going to talk about all the wonderful, unique, really cool things that you're doing at your clinic in California. We're also going to take a deep dive into the mitochondria of the electron transport chain and methylene blue and other modalities. But before we get there, Doc, let's talk about your history. Um, I understand that there was a lot of pain to purpose with your brother, your father, and your mother. So share a little bit about your backstory and what inspired you to get involved with the work that you're doing right now. Yeah, well, first of all, again, just thank you for uh, having me on here. Um, just super appreciative. Also, I want to give a shout out to my amazing Oasis Family Medicine team. Uh, again, I couldn't do what I do without them. And uh, yeah, I'm here. So ask me questions. I just want to be of service to all of your listeners. And, you know, with that being said, my younger brother uh, had spinal meningitis when he was one or two years old. And so he grew up with seizures um, until he passed away from a seizure when he was 25. He was three years younger than me. So I kind of grew up in that space of just brain, being interested in brain health. Um, how can we help the neurological system? And fortunately, you know, I'm happy to say he lived a very full life considering it was short, shortened. Um, but he also had about 20 to 25% of his brain removed when he was younger because it was so infected. Uh, so he was affected greatly. Um, and, and so that really set the tone for me being interested in medicine, just in healing, I would say. Um, and my, I didn't know it at the time so much, but my mom also, I grew up out on 40 acres in the middle of nowhere, no electricity, no, you know, no, no real toilet, no TV, no, no phone. Um, but it was also ripe with uh, a lot of Lyme disease ticks. And so my mom has had Lyme disease since maybe the late seventies, at least the early eighties. So, you know, watching her go through that, it's, it's affected her body greatly, um, largely under control, I would say at this point, but you know, it went decades without really good treatment. And so, and part of that, part of what's affected is her brain, um, just more on a sleep level uh, scale. And so again, though, you know, for anybody who's been affected with Lyme or is in that Lyme community, they understand how much the neurological system can be affected. And so I ended up uh, studying in college for animal physiology and neuroscience, um, and then going to medical school. Right. And then right after I was actually done with residency, or maybe it was my third year, my father actually got uh, diagnosed with ALS, another major neurological quandary. Right. And this was right when I was getting into more integrative, alternative, functional medicine, um, and just really just, just dipping into it. And we were able to do some cool stuff. Um, I was obviously very motivated to up my level of understanding uh, outside of what allopathic conventional medicine had to offer. 
um, for my dad's sake. And he, he lived in Northern California. I live in Southern California. The times when he was able to come down and do treatments in my office regularly, those were actually, interestingly, the only times where his ALS symptoms would plateau. Wow. They wouldn't, they would not, uh, he would not digress. And uh, which is saying a lot for ALS, because that's just a slow deteriorating disease until death for almost everyone mm-hmm. who has it. Um, when he would go away back up home for, you know, his own reasons, he, had his, he has his own soul journey. And um, uh, that's when he would, that's when he would decline. And we were able to, I would say he was given, I believe it was eight, 12 to 18 months when he was originally diagnosed and he lasted for three and a half, four years. So we got him an extra few years of life and he was a a great person in so many ways and just amazing positive attitude. So it was easy to work with him on that in that way. Um, I do think that, you know, he passed away, gosh, it's been seven years now. Um, I think with what I have now, it would be very interesting to work with him more closely on the physical realm. Uh, but, you know, the past is the past that happened. But I, I just, it's kind of to say, I think what we have now in our office and, and what is available elsewhere um, is more, more than it was five, seven, 10 years ago. And so the, uh, the healing realms, the healing industry in the United States is, is improving. There's uh, lots of technology and, um, I just, it's really a pleasure to be part of that, um, and kind of be on the forefront in some small way. And, uh, yeah, so that's, that's what brings me to today. Yeah. It's thank you for sharing that. So have you worked recently with any patients that have, um, ALS? Have you applied some of your more recent tools on, on that? I've definitely had a few over the years. Um, it's not something I've really publicized, so we don't we don't have a lot of individuals with ALS. I should just mention I at our office where there's another doctor, Dr. Ann Quo, and then there's a family nurse practitioner, Kelly Kell. Um, so they also see patients. So they each have a couple of um, patients who have been diagnosed with ALS, and you know I think we're. Um, you know, I don't want to overstate what we're doing for them. And oftentimes there's so much, so many different modal treatment modalities going into. Um, so I don't want to claim all the credit, but I do believe that we are making a big difference. You know, I can say that with utmost honesty. I think we're making a big difference in their lives. Yeah, you, you sure are. And you're going to make a big difference right now with uh, my audience. And I'm grateful for that. You mentioned that you are excited about, you know, cutting edge research, some of the new technologies, some of the new tools we have available to us that really could put a dent in some of these devastating statistics when it comes to health, which is uh, really, you know, sick care. We see these crazy stats out there. One in three women are diagnosed with cancer within their lifetime in the U.S. For men, one in two. You know, it's also predicted by the CDC's website that in uh, 10 years, by 2032, that one in two children are projected to be born on the autism spectrum. We know that there's diabetes that's increasing. They also estimate that one in two Americans will be obese by 2030, right? Not overweight, but obese. So we have things that are working. We have ancient healing strategies like ketosis, intermittent fasting. We have things like methylene blue, which we'll get to but why are these disease stats not getting better? And what can we do to turn this thing around, doc? And that's a quite a, quite a question, quite a quandary could probably have a long political decision. Cause I think a lot of it comes down to politics, um, certain industrial influences, i.e. pharma and, mm-hmm. um, just poor education and, uh, a poor, poor education, poor health education for our politicians. Um, And, and, uh, you know, where's the money being spent on advertisement, right? You you see all kinds of it. it, It's only turn on the TV. I don't watch barely any myself. But, you know, my understanding is that you turn on the TV and you all you're bombarded by pharmaceutical ads, right? How often are you bombarded by a methylene blue ad? never. How, how often are you bombarded by an ozone ad? Never. How often are you bombarded by a, a ketosis ad, right? right. Never. And um, 
So I think that we're just kind of heading in, my opinion is we're just kind of heading, I think the population is really going to kind of start start more and more splitting into two segments. And it's kind of going to be the people who are um, in the know of what real health is and are kind of on that journey, not to say anybody's perfect on that journey. We're all humans, right? So um, even the healthiest individuals are still going to be looking, but there's going to be the health conscious people. And then there's going to be everyone else in the United States. And unfortunately, you know, I think the average life expectancy has actually ticked down the past year or two, if I'm not mistaken. And I don't believe that's due to COVID. I think that's in general because of all those chronic conditions that you just mentioned. Um, but again, we're going to get these these uh, these people who are more into their health, the biohackers, the anti-agers, um, whose life expectancy starts increasing more and more because we have so much amazing technology. And then you're going to get the people, unfortunately, who just for whatever reason are not in the know um, or are just not ready to uh, explore their health more in depth. And that life expectancy is going to be going down. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I agree with that. And the cool thing about podcasts like this one and many, many others and YouTube channels that get out this type of information, it's its kind of like a grassroots movement, right? And uh, those listening and watching, like you could really put a, help us put a dent in disease by listening and sharing and, you know, copying and paste a link to somebody, you know, who has metabolic damage, who has Lyme disease or whatever it is and say, you know, I think this episode is, uh, you're going to get value from this episode. Like just by sharing conversations like this, number one, having the conversations. So I'm so grateful. And then number two, getting it out there. So it's exciting to me. It's one of the things that lights me up. It's what I do, you know, full time. I'm hundred percent virtual with my YouTube channel, the podcast and my courses. And I love bringing people on like you who are the experts who are doing this clinically. Like you have your own practice. You're in Glendale, California. It's a, it's called Oasis um, Family Medicine. And we'll put a link for your website, which is dryoshi.com. But actually, it's it's actually yeah. the best link is oasisfamilymedicine.com. Oasisfamilymedicine.com. That's better. So we'll yeah. put that in the show notes. And then and I just want to real quickly echo what you said um, to all the listeners out there, like you're listening to this, but, um, you know, hit, hit send to someone else uh, and just say, Hey, what do you think? It's kind of a really nice open-ended mm -hmm. way of inviting somebody, but not telling them a certain thing. So love that idea. What do you think of this? That's great. Give this a listen and tell me what you think. All right, let's talk about methylene blue. Uh, I think this is the first time that we are going to take a deep, deep dive into it. We've had Dr. John Laurence before, mutual friends of ours, and we've kind of touched upon it, but I want to do a deep dive. So Dr. Yoshi, um, what, what's the history of methylene blue? When did we discover this and uh, what's the unique history of it? Yeah, so it's actually been around for a little over a hundred years. Um, and it was one of the first... Uh, true medications in the United States. Uh, it is it is a dye. It's blue in its oxidized form um, and it's reduced form. It's clear. Uh, I, I believe it's been on the World Health Organization's list of essential medications actually to fight uh, parasites for a long time. It can be used. It's, it's extremely antiviral um, and really good for mitochondria. Um, mm. And it's that mitochondria aspect that I love it for and what we're mainly using it for. Um, and, you know, we don't, what I, what I've said is we don't have a deficiency of methylene blue in our system. Right. And so why would we use it? Part of that conversation is I think it's always best to weigh the pros and cons of any therapy that we're looking into, right. Whether it's a medication, a surgery, an herb, a homeopathic, like what are the risks versus the benefits, right? And the cool thing about methylene blue is it's really just, you know, it can be called a dye, but it's really just a salt. Um, and it's, uh, it's harmless unless you're doing it in just ridiculous dosages. Okay. What would be a ridiculous dosage? Yeah. So the studies if you go on Google, if someone goes on Google and, you know, side effects of methylene blue, um, it's actually been a long time since I did that, but I remember, you know, watch out for this and watch out for that. Well, the side effects are really only seen in individuals who were 
having open parathyroid surgery, and then methylene blue was being poured into that open surgical um, space or wound, right? And so their parathyroids were just being soaked up. And so we're talking um, like thousands of milligrams, okay? okay? I usually, myself, I say, if we're under 400 milligrams in a day, you're, I have not seen any research of any sort that suggests that's harmful or dangerous in any ways. Um, and most methylene blue products out there, you know, there's, there's one, I don't have any affiliation to them. Troscriptions. Um, mm -hmm. they have a little, a trochee where you, for those of you who are not aware, you can, you can take the whole thing or you can cut it up into halves or quarters and just put it between your gum and your cheek and let it, um, soak into your blood system, blood, blood vessels that way, uh, slowly. And that you're looking at four milligrams, maybe 16 milligrams, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so that's a typical methylene oral dosage, um, yeah. super safe. Truly. I have never seen anybody have a side effect from that amount. The only um, side effect is that your mouth turns blue. <laughs> yes. That's yeah. Good, good point. And what's interesting. Um, I, I actually thought about doing that before coming onto this. It's <laughs> just, so I talk with a blue mouth, um, but it, it absorbs into your system. So you, you look at yourself in the mirror and you're like, oh my gosh, this is what would I, you know, and you can try to wash it out, but it doesn't even work, but your body no. will actually absorb it within uh, my experience is probably 30 minutes to an hour, maybe two hours hours um because your 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 mitochondria just soak it up mm. um what else the the half-life of it is about 12 hours and uh so doing it once or twice a day um if you're if you're in real need of some mitochondrial support uh, could be very useful uh, i was talking on dosages so yeah four to 16 milligrams super super safe a lot of people go up to 60 milligrams pretty mm -hmm. easily um some people go up more you know our our we have some mutual friends who um go up higher than that and uh, i've certainly done it higher than that um dr lawrence has a uh, suppository yeah um, tried that as well and you know it, again as long as you're under 400 if, if you're under 400 milligrams um it, there, there's no concern. Uh, even if you are on SSRIs, which again, if you go on Dr. Google, um, you'll be warned about being on SSRIs. Well, I believe that the reason, and I, when I say I believe, I, you know, I've um, listened and read Dr. Um, Gonzalez Lima, Francisco Gonzalez Lima. Um, he's there in the Austin area, I believe. Uh, he's done a lot of work on methylene blue. He's a researcher and, um, you know, he, he, uh, he believes that the reason it can actually help mood, i.e. depression is because you're actually supplying energy to the mitochondria and depression in one manner might be because we are too low energy, right? Mm -hmm. What happens if I'm too low energy, I'm going to be depressed. My feelings are going to be depressed. My emotions are going to be depressed. And so it's just really important to kind of note why somebody might be depressed, but ultimately it's about that mitochondrial energy. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. The, it's all about the might, the mighty mitochondria, right? And you, you said we don't have a methylene blue deficiency, but we do have people who have struggling mitochondria who have been taken hit. So this is a great tool that could supercharge the mitochondria. And I want to get a little bit more into that. You have a great analogy about this electron transport chain, which for the average person, it's like really hard to kind of explain to them how that works, how the mitochondria produces energy via ATP. So you have a great analogy about a freeway on ramp. If you could share that so my audience could really understand how this works. Yeah, gosh, it's been a little while since I used that analogy. We'll see if I can get it right. <laughs> but um, first, I just want to kind of zoom out. Okay. The, the reason we breathe air is for oxygen. And the reason we eat food, um, we get nutrients, but a huge part of the reason we eat food is to get electrons. And oxygen and electrons come together into our cells and our cells have, depending on what type of cell, what tissue we're talking about in the body, um, it can have a few to uh, tens of thousands of mitochondria actually mm -hmm. in each cell. And a mitochondria is kind of like a little mini, 
it's kind of like a little mini cell within the cells, right? So each cell has a bunch of mitochondria. Um, if we're talking about a brain, a neuron, uh, one neuron cell, it has many, many mitochondria, thousands, tens of thousands, even. Even and, I've even read um, up to 2.5 million in certain regions. Yes, of the brain. exactly. Yeah. And just, I guess on that, on that front, um, you know, you're the most mitochondrial dense tissues in the body tend to be the brain, the heart, um, and then actually the ovaries yeah. uh, and, and sperm. And those use the most of our energy, right? Our brain actually uses about 25% of our energy. As far as I remember, might be a little bit off there, but basically it uses a lot of energy and that's the and it's, cool. It's, I was going to say that those, um, or those cells that you mentioned that are very metabolically, um, high in demand, the brains, the ovaries, the eyes, the heart, et cetera, what they all have in common is they're, they're mostly needed for survival. The number one priority for the body is survival. So it makes sense that those are the cells that are loaded with mitochondria, because I believe the average cell has hundreds to a few thousand mitochondria, but the brain cells could have over a million ovaries have about a hundred thousand in a single cell. So it's really fascinating that that's where I believe in God. I believe God put it there and it's all for survival. It's so, so interesting. Yeah. And it kind of, um, you know, you can have these mitochondria that die off, but then you can have half functioning mitochondria, basically poor, poorly efficient, not efficient mitochondria. And so in a situation where you're in, you know, have a metabolic disease like diabetes, or if you have dementia, right, your, your neurons don't in dementia, your neurons don't, your, the mitochondria are actually not working well. And that's the cool part about the methylene blue is it goes right to the mitochondria that need it most, that mm. could benefit from it most. And that's actually how it was used um, initially in science was um, as a staining method for cells. And they noticed that it would go right to the mitochondria. That's why it was useful to stain cells in science. Um, Interesting. Yeah. So uh, where was I? Oh, on the analogy. So again, the whole reason we breathe oxygen and eat food, bring oxygen and electrons into the mitochondria. And the mitochondria, there's basically these complexes, this little electron transport chain. And the whole purpose is for those electrons to kind of go through that system, that little chain that or train. And at the end of it, we produce ATP energy, our body's main energy source. Or really, it's the currency of energy in our body is what it is. That's the whole point of it. And, um, and I kind of, Meth so methylene blue is an electron donor. It's kind of uh, it's kind of like food. It's food for the mitochondria, and um, so I actually am going to kind of switch up the analogy because I think of methylene blue in the mitochondria as this kindling for a fire. Think of oxygen as the air, as the as as oxygen to the fire, and then the cool part is once you add light into that electron mm. transport chain, those photons, that's like adding gasoline to the fire to produce this. It's like a furnace in the bottom of the Titanic ship, right? It's like this furnace producing this energy. And so if we, when we add in methylene blue and more oxygen or ozone, and then add in light, that's like this powerful, um, just combustion engine, which is truly what the mitochondria is to produce energy, to make us go. And disease, there's many reasons for disease, but one of them is not having enough energy, right? When we get out of our body's way, when we correct the deficiencies and, and take out the toxins, our body knows how to heal, especially when it has enough energy, when it has enough cellular energy, our body heals. Like that's, that's its job. It's, it's, it's divine, divinely knows how to do this. Right. And um, so that's the, the beauty of methylene blue is it knows right where the energy issue is, where the energy deficiency is, and it goes right there and improves it. I love it. I love what you said. The quote I have wrote down here, methylene blue is food for the mitochondria. Like simply put, 
Uh, and uh, when you think about people who have chronic fatigue or they, they call some of these individuals COVID long haulers or you know, autoimmune disease, what they all have in common is that the mitochondria are producing less energy and that it's doing it for a reason because the mitochondria, as we now know through recent research with Dr. Robert Navio, that it's not just producing energy, the mitochondria, there also is an intelligence in the mitochondria that's like a sensor and if there's too much stress, this wartime metabolism, it shuts down energy production for survival. Um, so that's where we get chronic fatigue and all these issues. But methylene blue is a great way to give your mitochondria some of the building blocks to start producing more energy. And what you said was interesting. You said that the innate intelligence, if you will, will de determine when you take methylene blue, the innate intelligence will determine which mitochondria and which regions will use that the most and which needs it the most, which is super fascinating to me. And here's the ultimate biohack, because we know also that ketones, when you're in ketosis, communicate with your mitochondria to make more of themselves. That's why when we think about one molecule of glucose gives you about 32 to 36 ATP, one molecule of ketones gives you 400% more, like 132 ATP. Why? Because it's duplicating and duplicating itself. So a great biohack, and I want to hear your thoughts, being in ketosis taking methylene, methylene blue and getting red light. What a great trifecta. What do you think about that? Oh my gosh. That's, I mean, you want to talk about health? Yeah. <laughs> Amen, brother. <laughs> um, and, and you mentioned light. I had mentioned that before. I, I wanted to go a little bit more into that. Methylene yeah. blue absorbs light on pretty much the full visible light spectrum. However, it absorbs best between 660 and 670, which is kind of the, the heart, the center of the red light spectrum. And so when you get methylene blue and add in red light, which the sun, regular old sunlight has red light in it. Um, so you don't necessarily need to go out and get this, one of those fancy red light panels. Although if you wanted to amp it up, getting a nice red light panel, especially in the 660 to 670 uh, nanometer spectrum, um, supercharges that electron transport chain charges, supercharges that methylene blue and supercharges your energy production. And you're absolutely right. Combine that with ketosis. And I mean, talk about a, you know, one, two, three punch um, towards health. Like, wow, what a gift. Yeah, it's amazing. I, I can tell you this. I'm actually, I was just traveling this week. I was in Las Vegas. I just got back yesterday morning, red eye from Vegas to Miami. Never fun. And uh, today I'm back, you know, I'm in ketosis. I did a nice fasted workout on my rooftop. I got some nice sunlight for about 45 minutes, sunshine. And then I came in here and I knew my interview with you was coming up. And I had some suppository uh, methylene blue from Dr. John Laurence, the 200 milligram one. So I just took yeah. it about an hour ago. I got red light. So I did about 15 minutes of red light before I got on here. And I'm feeling like a million bucks, right? Yes. I'm experiencing what you're what you're sharing here. It's like my brain is on fire. I feel really good, and it and it actually helped with the the jet lag that I was experiencing. So, what are other benefits somebody might um, experience with methylene blue? What are other things you've noticed with it? Yeah, so a clarity of mind, mm -hmm. right? Um, it it kind of because because it's supplying enough energy to the brain. It's really it helps with concentration helps clarity of mind. It helps that brain fog lift. Um, and then just physical energy. Like those are the, those are the big ones. Okay. Now, you know, we will also use it. It gets excreted through the kidneys, any excess blood, um, methylene blue gets excreted through the kidneys. So if you take methylene blue, your urine might turn bluish green, right? It's yeah. kind of blue mixed with yellow of, of typical urine makes green. So um, do not be alarmed for the first timers out there. Uh, you can, you can, you can urinate blue or green for a little bit. Yeah. Um, and if and you if, take a suppository, your poop might be blue as well. Just to give you a heads up. <laughs> yeah. And um, be, be careful if you're using a suppository with those fingers, it yeah. could be very obvious. Yeah. <laughs> for the first time. Yeah. I actually have a little bit on my nails here from yeah. the suppository. <laughs> yeah. A little and, blue. Um, but your body will absorb that. It's, it's all good and um, totally safe. Um, but because it is excreted through the uh, kidneys and goes into the bladder, actually it can be really good for bladder infections. So I like for kind of chronic UTIs um, that maybe are resistant to antibiotics, or if you want to go a route other than antibiotics, there's a lot of good natural therapies, but just one 
one extra way of going about it would be to take some methylene blue um, in our office. We actually give it IV and, uh, and then shine some red light over the bladder and that just takes care of it. It takes, it's like directly germicidal. So it directly kills uh, wow. unwanted bacteria um, and viruses, but then it also adds energy into the system. Um, so it, uh, there's, some, there's some doctors out there who have used uh, this product, uh, methylene blue uh, intravenously for a number of uh, common viruses as of late, um, very effectively. It, it is directly antiviral uh, and um, antiparasitic. Uh, and so it, it fights infections very, very well. It fights acute infections, but then again, it fights in chronic, chronic infections because it'll kill the, the infection uh, entity itself. But again, in, in chronic, like chronic Lyme, for instance, um, you're really dealing with in addition to the actual spirochetes in this case, you're really dealing with mitochondria that are inefficient. And, um, and so to be able to help those mitochondria directly as well uh, is phenomenal. So it's phenomenal for chronic infections. It's a, it's a great tip that you just shared about the uh, chronic UTIs. Uh, my fiance had a UTI a couple of weeks ago, and I came across that tip just recently that you shared about the UTI and the red light. So next time, if she ha happens to get it again, methylene blue, red light on the abdomen, and I'm going to, I'm going to let you know how it goes. Yes. That's very interesting. I, I, I do have a question uh, about the mitochondria with methylene blue, and then we'll transition mm -hmm. into how you use it uniquely at your clinic. I, uh, from my understanding, I know that ketones create more mitochondria, which is this mitogenesis. Right. But like, here's the thing. We know that the more ATP a, a mitochondria produces, the more free radicals it produces, right? So how does it make sense that more mitochondria actually lowers inflammation like as ketones do? Well, we know that it uncouples the mitochondria to get rid of these excess free radicals, reactive oxygen species. So this mitochondrial uncoupling that ketones do with the mitochondria. Now, we know that methylene blue also helps the mitochondria produce more ATP as well. Is there also this mitochondria uncoupling taking place with methylene blue, or is there some other mechanism that's helping to get rid of any free radicals produced? Yeah, the free radicals. So a lot of it's interesting, right? A lot of people in the US are taking too many antioxidants, right? We get out their bag and it's got like 30 yep. antioxidant supplements in it, right? And the body is this, again, it's this divinely complex and yet kind of simple machine uh, in a way. And it's this balance between oxidation and redoxidation or antioxidants and, and pro-oxidants. And our body needs to be able to um, use both when it needs to use both, right? And so it's this give and take. It's not, um, antioxidants are not all good or bad. Oxidation is not all good or all bad. It's, it's, your, it's having the ability for your body to flip the switch back and forth when it's appropriate, right? Um, it depends a lot on, you know, what stressors are on your system, whether it's an infection stressor, stressor or exercise is a stressor. Um, we, we, it's about that ability to go back and forth. Um, now, um, methylene blue actually speeds up that electron transport chain. It kind of, it actually skips the there's there's these complexes complex one two com, complex one complex two complex three complex four complex five in the mitochondria and it can actually by adding in that electron donor can actually speed up that process and to produce more atp um, which is it's a it's it's a very unique molecule in that way um, i'm not there are probably other products like that, but off the top of my head, actually, I'm curious if you know something off the top of your head that does it in the same way. Um, cause I'm not. Yeah, no, I mean, the mind. only thing that I'm thinking of is it's a different mechanism. Like astaxanthin acts as like a kind of a, a, a protective barrier for the mitochondrial membrane, but I don't think right. it speeds up the transport chain. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah, fascinating. So it's interesting. And yeah. then, and again, and then when those little photons packet of photons from the light come in and hit that, uh, membrane where all those complexes are that electron transport chain it just that even just revs revs it up even more hmm. 
That is super cool. I just, the more I learn about the human body, it's just like, I'm just so amazed by it. What a blessing right? and a gift. We have this mm. incredible human body, right? Oh, it is so amazing. Oh, yeah. I could revel in it. I do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, and the more I study the membrane, whether it's the cell membrane or the mitochondria membrane, the more I'm just blown away. I, I feel like the most of the intelligence is in that membrane uh, mm -hmm. versus like just your DNA nucleus. It's, it's like the bodyguard that communicates with the membrane. Would you agree that most of the intelligence is in the membrane? Yeah, that's interesting. I, I love the membrane. I mean, I've been preaching to our patients, like our cell membrane is so important, getting those good quality oils in us, right? It takes so long after we eat crappy um, oil that is so prevalent in our American, typical American diet. Um, you know, that oil is a major component of our cell membranes. Mm -hmm. And we need oil changes and the oil change happens very slowly. Um, I actually, you know, I was telling my wife, I'd be curious your, your thoughts on this, but I was telling my wife a couple of weeks ago, we have a couple, few, three little kids. Uh, and then we were coming back from a party and I'm like, I'd rather our kids eat a little bit of sugar rather than bad oils because sugar, we can at least burn off right? Especially a health, healthy young children, right? They can, they can burn that sugar off. Um, it can get out of the system very quickly, relative, relatively speaking, compared to oils. When you eat bad oils, those go in there and they're there. Uh, you know, you probably know better than me, but for months or years, yeah. right? And so it is a very clutch part of our body's health to make sure we're getting in good oils. And then the other part is, you know, that kind of exclusion zone water or um, structured water, um, that structured water gel of, you know, how does that fit into the cell? And I think we're still learning this as a, as a community, right? Um, but I'm really curious how that all uh, plays into communication. Um, is, is that structured water, but more specifically structured gel in our cells. Mm. And uh, I'm, I'm looking into that because it, it seems very interesting. Uh, in addition to what you're saying about the cell membranes carrying a lot of that communication. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I remember you gave a tip about a simple thing about the sea salt and the sunlight with water. You want to share that real quick? Yeah, a simple way to structure water, right? Where humans are, how we used to get our water was from springs or rivers, right? That have uh, natural minerals in them and combine water with minerals with sunlight and that structures the water. And so just a simple little tip, um, get clean water, even if it's tap water that's been, um, you know, had all the crap taken out of it, filtered out of it, and then add in a little bit of a pinch of high quality sea salt, um, and then go put it in the sun for even just, even just a few seconds or a few minutes wow. is going to structure the water, give it a little stir, and that'll structure the water. And you absorb that water, you absorb structured water into your body better. And um, again, that's on the, the cellular communication, you know, how, how much does that affect us? Um, hard to quantify, but I, I bet it does. That's a great little simple tip. It's just going to help with, uh, with redox cell, cell to cell communication. Um, and it's very easy to do sprinkle yeah. in some salt with high quality water. I, you know, you could use hydrogen water, spring water, mm -hmm. whatever it is, put it outside, uh, for a few seconds to a minute, drink it and boom, do that every single day. And the, the compound effect, you'll notice it going back to what you said. I love what you just shared about the oils. I, 100% agree with you. And I have said the same thing. And I've had, I've had like Dr. Ben Bickman, who's the insulin guy. I've had other, you know, leaders on my podcast. And um, I brought up the same thing. What's worse for your health, you know, sugar or vegetable oils, PUFAs. And uh, you're right, because if somebody consumes sugar, you're active, you do some squats, you go for a walk, whatever it is, especially kids, you could burn it right off. But you consume these bad oils, these rancid fats, the half-life, uh, I've done the research, the half-life for them is two years. <laughs> yeah. Two wow. years. That takes a long time wow. to get out of your body. The sugar you could burn off. So I'm 100% with you, Doc. I Avoid know, the you know, French fries. Yeah, uh, it's not worth it. You know, if you could get the French fries in avocado oil, coconut oil, which is pretty rare unless you do it yourself, much, much better. But it's not worth the hit. It's really not worth the hit. 
eat the cake without the vegetable oils. If you're going right. to do something, <laughs> what I do uh, at restaurants and it drives my fiance crazy sometimes is the first thing I ask the waiter or the waitress, you know, what oils do you cook with? And it's always a poof. And I just say that we're allergic. Can you use butter, olive oil, et cetera. But that little thing goes a long way. What do you do at restaurants? Do you do something similar? Yeah, I always, I, I mean, I have, I try to avoid, I try to avoid meats and fats when I'm out to eat. I'm not a vegetarian. I, I do enjoy high quality meat, but, um, you know, my understanding is it's a lot better to eat uh, vegetables and fruits with those good oils on them. Uh, even if they are not organic, um, it's easier for a body to get rid of pesticides than it is bad oils. Well, why not the meat? Um, because they've grain fed that is that why antibiotics and yeah, yeah. Bad oils. Okay. Got bad it. oils. Cause yeah, the oil, I the just... bad oils that are in the actual meat that you absorb. Mm -hmm. Got it. Exactly. Yeah. That makes yeah. sense. So hope that helps. You know, it's a very practical, we all have to, I mean, we all go to restaurants and you just got to make those requests and those changes. All right. Let's talk about your clinic. You've got an awesome clinic that I'm going to, I'm going to visit, um, in Glendale, California. It's called Oasis family medicine. We'll put your link down below oasisfamilymedicine.com. You have some really unique ways of using methylene blue along with ozone. And you mentioned the red light. So share a little bit about how you use this and some other cool modalities you do at your clinic. Yeah. So something we've been working on over the last year and a half, two years, really at this point, uh, is using ozone, which I think we do the best version of ozone, the most effective versions version of it, uh, therapy combined with light combined with methylene blue. And, uh, I think we're maybe one of the first probably one, probably maybe the first, um, probably one of the first, at least, um, again, I don't want to overstate, but I, I don't, I didn't know of anybody else doing it at the time that we started. Um, there are a lot of different types of ozone therapies out there and it, frankly, any one of them are good. Okay. The only negative uh, thing about ozone is you don't want to breathe it. As long as you're not breathing it, it's amazing in the body. And really ozone is, almost always a mixture of oxygen and ozone. And so you can do it, you know, there's, there's a, you can do it rectal ozone, you can do vaginal ozone, there's ozonated water, there's um, uh, kind of moving up the ladder, you can do MAH, major autohemotherapy ozone, where you, uh, that's usually done in a doctor's office where they'll take off a little bit of maybe 50 cc's or 100 cc's of blood, put it into a bag, and then add in some ozone, kind of shake it around, and then it drips back into you. Um, what does amazing. ozone do? Like for somebody who has no idea what it what it is, what does ozone do? Yeah, good, good, uh, good, great question. So, ozone is at the end of the day, what it does is it balances inflammation. It balances cytokines, and a lot of people are more familiar with the cytokine storm these last. Mm -hmm couple of years, right? And so really cytokines are part of the immune system and it balances the immune system out. Cytokines are also important in the inflammation cascade. And so when you're balancing cytokines out, it, it balances inflammation and inflammation is not good or bad. It's just the body needs to know when to use inflammation. If we get cut, we want to create a, an inflammatory reaction around that area so that we can bring, um, kill off what needs to be killed that may have entered our, our body, and then also create a healing response in that area. And so inflammation is not good or bad. Having a ramped up immune system is not good or bad, right? You, when you get exposed to an infection, you want to, your your immune system to uh, ramp up, so to speak. Um, we don't want it chronically stuck in that in that state, though. That turns into an autoimmune condition, right? And so, really, again, ozone at the end of the day, it balances out inflammation. It balances out the immune system. Um, so Ozone in kind of a mild to moderate oxidative burst. So this is a type of oxidation therapy, really upregulates the NRF2 pathway. Um, if you're if you're doing it, which which then um, kind of actually causes a increase in your um, antioxidant response system. So you're it. It's like this soft, gentle oxidation therapy actually causes your body to produce its own antioxidants. And so it's this beautiful give and take that occurs in the body. Um, ozone also uh, works 
very largely in that electron transport chain. So it increases NAD, it increases ATP, it increases metabolism. And so that's a little quick little overview on what ozone does um, in the body. It does all things good. Yeah, it sounds <laughs> um, amazing. And then there's kind of up from MAH, the major autohemotherapy, which is an IV therapy. There's a, something called 10 pass therapy. And that's where, again, they're kind of taking blood out of the body, mixing it under hyperbaric ozone pressure, and then it goes back in and you can do that up to 10 times. That's a phenomenal therapy. Um, that's done with very high concentrations of ozone. What we do in our office is something called EBU, um, which stands for extracorporeal blood oxygenation and ozonation. So in other words, blood is coming out of one arm, going through this filter that is being exposed to oxygen and ozone. And then that goes back into your body, into typically the other arm. And so it's this, your blood is going outside of your body and getting oxygenated and ozonated, and then it goes back into the arm. Now mm. you can, we use it, it's, it's special. I think it's kind of the creme de la creme version of ozone therapy because you can do it in with lower concentrations of ozone. So it's not too hard on the body. That's not too hard on the red blood cells. And you can do this continuously over 40 to 60 minutes approximately. And so it's just this really gentle way, but at the end of the day, you're getting in a much larger dose of ozone, um, which translates into better health at the end of the day. Um, and then you can, what we do in our office is we will also actually run it through light therapy. So um, ultraviolet blood ra irradiation, so kind of light on the ultraviolet light end of the spectrum, the full visible spectrum, extra red light, as well to activate the methylene blue that we also do, um, and then infrared therapy as well. So um, we're, again, kind of going back to that electron transport chain, we're getting methylene blue as extra electron donors, we're getting oxygen and ozone, which together those speed up, it's kind of like the, um, the, the methylene blue, the electron donors, the more that get added into the system, the more oxygen it actually wants to suck mm -hmm. in. And then you add on all of those different light wavelengths and that just turbocharges that electron transport chain to create more energy, which then causes a healing response. And so, so yeah, again, I, I mean, we're the only office that has been doing it in the past. Um, I definitely talked to a number of practitioners, so there'll be more places popping up in the future, which is great. I think this is a therapy that needs to be done more um, all around the US. So I'm excited for that to occur. And it's it a, happens because of podcasts like this. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And it's a brilliant, I mean, process that sounds absolutely incredible. I just love the the thoughts, uh, the, the research and the, 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 the ideas that went behind in it, behind this process and how it all kind of works together to just help you produce more energy, help you feel good. So somebody who has chronic fatigue, somebody who has a COVID long hauler, like this is very important for you. Or if somebody just wants to feel better, biohack your health and just feel like a rock star, this would be a great idea for you. One more thing before we wrap up the episode, I know you also do some things to support the lungs, right? You do an ozone dialysis, which as we know, you know, if somebody gets scarring of the lungs or if somebody goes through some sort of virus scare or something like that, we won't name it, this is going to be very important. So share a little bit more about this specific procedure. Yeah, so actually, I'm glad you brought that up because EBU, the extracorporeal blood oxygenation and ozonation is also kind of referred to as ozone dialysis or EB02. Mm. Um, we previously in our office called it O3D, but it seems over the last two years, it seems like the main name for that is EBU at this point. And so they're pretty interchangeable. There's a, a number of practitioners who now are doing it and it's all done a little bit differently. Um, we all kind of came up with our own names, um, but at the end of the day, it's really EBU. That's the central concept. And we're all doing it a little bit different with little different dosages of ozone and maybe introduced it slightly differently. But that is, um, EBU is ozone dialysis, is EBO2, is re RHP, recirculatory hemoperfusion. Um, yeah. And it, the whole reason I actually got into this uh, wanted to bring this into the office was because at the beginning of the pandemic in those first couple of weeks where um, I didn't know really what was happening. Um, you know, 
kind of became more clear pretty quickly after that. But I have a mother-in-law who has idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which is a slow scarring of the lung tissue until you either die or get a lung transplant. And, um, and we've been able through this, just kind of everything we do in our office, the kind of regenerative medicine in general, um, we've really been able to hold her steady, which is amazing because wow. she had a brother who died of this um, mother who died of it her other sister has it and she's deteriorating she's actually over in florida she's not close to my office and um so the fact that my mother-in-law has been stable for a number of years now says a lot and she's doing conventional medicine as well so i again i don't want to take all credit because all, all the credit probably isn't mine but what we've been able to do on top of that supposedly irreversible disease is uh, kind of incredible. But at the beginning of the pandemic, I, I'm like, what else could I add into my toolbox to help her in case she got this um, lung infection? And so I, that, that, that kind of started the process of me figuring out how to build an Ebu machine. Um, and you know, again, she's, she's stable. Um, it's actually like four or five years after diagnosis at this point, which wow. is, I mean, it's, it's incredible. So that's why I brought it into our office. And then it's just kind of, okay, who else can we help with this? And um, there's so many patient stories. I think we've done more sessions of Ibu and, and especially our version of Ibu um, than any other uh, office in the country at this point. Um, so we just have a lot of experience and the, the people who really do well, um, yes, the biohackers, yes, the anti-agers um, are welcome to do it. They do do it, um, feel great. I love to do it. I, I like to do it before I go for a, a run. Um, mm -hmm. I ran track in college and so I'm, I'm a runner and, and I just feel like it, I feel like a Red Bull kind of sprouts my wings, right? And I can fly. Um, but the, the people who really do well with this, where it's a serious game changer, is um, the chronic fatigue, um, the brain fog, mm, and mold. Like, mm, interesting. these are people who have come, who are coming to us from all over the country at this point, um, who have been to not just a number of conventional doctors, but a number of uh, integrative functional medicine doctors who are doing a lot of things, a lot of the li basic lifestyle, basic lifestyle always first, right? Before you yeah. do something like this, of course. Um, but uh, assuming they've done that, um, this is so many of these um, individuals are saying how this is such a game changer for them. And so they're flying from Florida, they're flying from Washington, and they come repeatedly for a reason. So it's, um, I'm just really honored to um, be able to support these people in a way that they haven't been able to be supported before. Yeah, it's amazing. I, I love that. And if you want to learn more about Dr. Yoshi's clinic and his work, it's oasisfamilymedicine.com. Anywhere else, any social media? I know you have a YouTube channel as well, which we'll drop down below, but anywhere else you want to send the audience? Yeah, just go to that website. All the links are there. Okay, make it yeah. simple. We'll put it down below for everybody <laughs> to go check you out. And then also, um, Rachel, our show notes person, is also going to drop the YouTube interview you did with Dr. Pompa, where he actually went with his wife, Marilee, did some treatment. They recorded video of that. It's in that interview. So we'll drop that down below. So those who are listening or watching could watch that next. Uh, Dr. Yoshi, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your knowledge. You know, what I love about you is you went through a lot of pain, but you took that pain into a purpose to help other people to prevent the suffering that your family went through to prevent that. And I, and I love that thought process and that um, unselfishness, because I, I always say the Einstein quote, Einstein said, intellectuals solve problems, geniuses prevent them. And what you're doing is being preventative and helping so many others be preventative and uh, get to the root cause. So thank you for your time. I can't wait to check you out in person and you're doing amazing work. Yeah, super humbled. Thank you for those kind words. And, and again, thank you for spreading the word and um, doing all of your good work because it's uh, I'm, I'm just so thankful on behalf of myself, my patients and all of the, your listeners. And um, you're more than welcome to come out anytime. Thank you, Doc. Thank you.